When Cynthia came to TurboTax, she had just launched her new side gig, a true crime podcast. I'm a first-rate detective with a golden voice. As her TurboTax expert, I made her second income count by guaranteeing 100% accurate filing and her maximum refund. <clears throat> what did she do with that refund? Find out next week. Switch to Intuit TurboTax and make your moves count. See guarantee details at TurboTax.com slash guarantees. Experts only available with TurboTax Live. A science story, huh? And I just thought, well, I figured it, out. it was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true, personal stories about science. We are really excited. We have our five-year anniversary show coming up May 6th in New York City. All kinds of special guests. It's going to be a great show. Storycollider.org for details. This week's story is from Bradford Jordan. It was recorded in February 2015 at Littlefield in Brooklyn. Third grade show and tell is a high stakes game. Especially in Mr. Denholm's class at Castleview Elementary School in Riverside, California. Mr. Denholm is famous for having really awesome show and tells. And my class has some heavy hitters in it. We've got Pablo Cuellar, we've got Terrell Price, and we've got Hikaru Yamamoto. Hikaru Yamamoto had started the year by coming into class in a full traditional Japanese garb, kimono, and distributing traditional Japanese pastries to everyone in the class. She followed this up with a, a Japanese language lesson. Arigato gozaimasu. She killed it. She was awesome. It was the best show and tell I'd ever seen. <laughs> but I wanted to beat her. And I knew that in order to do this, I was going to need, I was going to need the help of my father, Dr. Kenneth Jordan. So I went home, and I said, Dad, I need your help. I need to win show and tell. <laughs> and my dad and I, we have a lot in common, actually. Uh, my dad was moving from working in a hospital to a private practice, uh, and I was a, the kind of kid who taught chess lessons at recess. So we both had this, like, this need, I think, to be impressive to be independent, to be fast, to be applauded, to win. And so together we hatched a plan that would create the world's most awesome show and tell experience for Mr. Denholm's third grade class, and we put that plan into action. Earlier in the year, I had played Mark Antony in the school production of Julius Caesar, so when I approached what was to me the stage of the classroom, which was to everybody else, the area in front of the blackboard, I said, friends, Romans, classmates, lend me your ears. I am here to introduce, for show and tell, my father, Dr. Kenneth Jordan. My dad did this right. He wore his costume. It was his white doctor's coat with his name stitched in light blue thread on the pocket. He had his prop, which was a large a uh, leather medical bag with his name also in gold leaf on the front. And he walked very deliberately forward in front of the class. And in a move of really striking authority, put his bag down on Mr. Denholm's desk, which I loved. <laughs> he said, my name is Dr. Kenneth Jordan. I am a neurologist. A neurologist is someone who studies the human nervous system, in particular, the brain. Who here knows anything about the brain? A couple of kids raised their hand. Uh, there was a discussion going on, and in my head, I was just thinking, Dad, get to the reveal. And it was like he heard me, because at that moment, he turned to his black leather bag, clicked it open, and reached inside, pulled out two latex gloves, and placed them very slowly and deliberately on his hands. Now, he didn't do the, like, ER network TV flourish where he snapped them on, but still, for an amateur, it was good. And then he turned back to his bag and sort of like 
like a medical Mary Poppins, he pulls out this huge uh, opaque Tupperware. This is the sort of thing that you might bring an enormous amount of coleslaw to a picnic in. And he places it on the desk and he cracks the lid of the Tupperware. And this vaguely medical, overpowering aroma just fills the room instantly. And I'm scanning, I'm just scanning the audience and I'm watching the, their, their curiosity get piqued. Then my dad, hero, reaches into this uh, Tupperware and like, like Arthur pulling his sword from the stone, he lifts up in front of everyone in the class. Yes, it's true, it's real. A human brain! Take that, Hikaru Yamamoto! <laughs> and then, like, a, like, a, like splitting a, a freshly cut avocado, he sort of just like rotates the halves and separates them. So he has a left hemisphere in one hand and a right hemisphere in the other hand. And that's my cue, and I grab a box of latex gloves and I just start distributing them to everybody in the room because what comes next is that all of us third grade kids get to pass around a human brain. We look at it, he tells us, where the hypothalamus is, where the brainstem is, where the pituitary gland, which he assures us will be very important soon, is. <laughs> and there is no doubt, no doubt in anyone's mind that this was the best show and tell ever. The next day we come into class and Mr. Denholm has written on the board, everybody take out a piece of paper and write a thank you letter to Dr. Jordan. Ha! That pack of thank you letters is still in my dad's reception area. <laughs> Later that year, my dad is picking me up from chess class, and he, he's, he pulls kind of up outside the chess class, and as I'm walking to the car, he pops the trunk, and he says, throw your stuff in the back. So I do, and when I'm doing it, I notice something in the back of the car. Sandwiched between his gym bag and the spare tire, is a large, opaque Tupperware. And I mean, it can't be. It's been months since show and tell. But I go to it and I open it, and there's that smell. And just bobbing up at the top like an apple is the top of, of a human brain. And in that moment, you know, Show and tell had been this amazing celebration, but in that moment, uh, outside of Chesford Juniors in Garden Grove, California, in the back of my dad's uh, Camry, that brain looked really creepy. Uh, it looked really creepy and really lonely and really morbid. And I said, Dad, why haven't you returned the brain? And he said, oh, you know, I'll get around, I'll get around to it. I've been really busy. <laughs> I was like, okay. But he didn't get around to it. It took him a long time. And sometimes at night, I would creep downstairs and go into the garage and pop the, the trunk and smell that formaldehyde smell and look at this brain. And I'd wonder who, whose brain it was and for whom that brain had thought thoughts, and for whom that brain had felt fear, and for whom that brain had loved. And then I would close it, and I would close the, the trunk, and I'd go back up to bed. So eventually he did return the brain, which, which was good. <laughs> it was for the best. Um, and many, many years later, I, uh, I was 16 years old, and uh, I needed my dad's help again because I needed to get a driver's license. I was 16, I was in Southern California. This was the thing to do. And my dad wasn't as helpful this time around. In fact, he said to me in no uncertain terms, son, I have had too many kids in my office with traumatic brain injuries to uh, ever let you get a driver's license at 16. I have studied the science and I know that between the ages of, or after the age of 18, drivers become much, much safer. So you're gonna have to wait till you're 18 to get your driver's license. This was a huge bummer to me. 
Uh, it's very hard to be someone who wants to be loved, who wants to be impressive, who wants to be applauded, who wants to be independent and not, and not have a car. Uh, and my dad said, son, let me tell you a story. There was a man named Michael. And this man was, had just gotten his driver's license and he was driving in his new car. And he liked his car so much that he decided to go well over the speed limit. And even though he was on open road, he lost control of the car and crashed. And in the emergency room, he died. And before they buried the body, the doctors took his brain out of his head and donated it to Loma Linda Medical Center. And when you were nine years old, I brought that brain into your classroom. And for him, I think for him it was like a really poetic, cautionary tale. But for me, it was the first time, it was the first time it had ever not just been a brain in the trunk or in my dad's hands, but it had been, it became a person. It wasn't the brain. It was Michael's brain. And it hadn't been a brain that I was talking to in the dimly lit garage late at night. It had been Michael's brain. Brain. It was Michael. And, um, and I, I didn't argue any further. Thank you. That was Bradford Jordan. Bradford is an actor, improviser, storyteller, and facilitator. He's a lead teacher at the People's Improv Theater in New York and an actor, director, and teacher with the National Arts and Literacy Organization, The Story Pirates, which teaches creative writing workshops to school kids and works with the creative team to adapt their stories to musical sketch comedy shows. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, and Ari Daniel. The podcast is produced by Rose Avalith. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Go. Special thanks to Littlefield for hosting the show and to my dad for being a geologist and having a rock collection, not a brain collection. Thanks for listening. Every day we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.